Welcome everyone. I am Dr. Bharti Kansara, Vice President of American Friends of SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies, London University. This is the fifth in our webinar series, which grew up as a response to the dark days of COVID-19 lockdown back in March, where we were finding a way of keeping going the dialogue between um, American uh, alumni and friends of SOAS and the mothership back in London. The webinar, I'm very delighted to tell you, these webinars are growing from strength to strength and we have more and more attendance, which is wonderful. Our webinar today is a heartwarming reunion between Rob Boucher, who was studying for a master's degree in East Asian studies at SOAS from 2010 to 20. Sorry, 2009 to 2010, and his academic mentor, Dr. Griseldis Kirsch. Ten years on, Rob is now chair of the A Philadelphia Asia American um, Film Festival, which is running as we speak. It started yesterday, November 5th and it'll be running till November 15th. So you have a very good opportunity to catch a couple of movies and we will be putting the link to register for the film festival into the Q&A box. Uh, ten years, Dr. Kirsch is head of the East Asian Languages and Cultures Department at SOAS. And among her many publications. She is author of Contemporary Sino-Japanese Relations on Screen, A History, 1989 to 2005. She has also written The Voice That Brought Peace, The Emperor as Hero, in a forthcoming book entitled A Handbook of Japanese Cinema. She'll put any questions that come to mind into the Q&A box, the chat box, and um, Dr. Griseldis Kirsch, who is our moderator for today, will select those questions uh, for further discussion with Rob um, after their conversation together. So without further ado, please welcome Griseldis Kirsch and Rob Boucher. Thank you, Dr. Kansara. We appreciate your warm welcome. And uh, thank you to all the attendees for joining us this morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, we're really looking forward to this conversation. Dr. Kirsch and I had a, a really excellent uh, pre-panel conversation last week. And um, you know, obviously, a lot of things have happened politically here in the United States since then. So that may be something we can also touch upon in, in certain aspects of this conversation. But before we get into that, I would like to share a brief video that shows a recap of the 2018 Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival, which I believe will give some context for the conversation that we're going to have beyond this abstract concept. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. The clip is about four minutes long. Without visibility, there's nothing for us. Never thought it was okay to be a filmmaker, okay to be a musician, because I never really saw people doing that who looked like me or came from a similar background. It's time now to see the depth of the Asian identity, because when you don't see yourself reflected on screen, there is that void. So many people who are not Asian American sort of lump us into one category. And what I love about these film festivals is that it shows there are so many different facets about being Asian American. It's important for us as an entire community to kind of approach this as a movement. Um, what's good for the filmmakers is good for the theater artists, which is also good for the musicians and the conference presenters. And essentially, we're all interconnected in our own way, and it's important for us to see our movement as such. Well, this year's festival dealt mainly with the music of Asian America as our central theme. So a lot of the programs, both on screen and off, had a lot to do with music, musical workshops, live concerts. 
We really try to think about history as just a collection of stories, whether it's creative writing or poetry or visual art to express those histories. It's not just about sort of representation on screens, but actually like an exchange of stories. We carry our identities regardless of where we are. I think that that helps us to kind of expand our understanding of Asian Pacific America, not just as something that's contained within the 50 states. There is talent out there and it goes way back from you know, history-wise to be where they are now. Part of the conversation that is starting to happen now is that after Crazy Rich Asians, we are in a new era of Asian American content. But at the same time, there are certain groups within our diaspora that aren't being prioritized. So we're trying to shed some light on these least visible communities. To have my film be one of the four Lao American films in PATH is a huge step and such a validating experience to have PATH just be like, hey, we're gonna put you in because we want you to be visible. It's not enough to just represent. It's not enough to be there. It's also important what is the artist say. When we kind of look at what's happening in contemporary political discourse, I think it's more important now than ever that we really face these issues head on. And so by curating an exhibit of anti-Asian racism, we're really encouraging the general public to question the kinds of political propaganda that we might be seeing today and its impact on Asian Americans. The film festival is extremely important and instrumental in raising awareness about the place of Asians in the media. There are a lot of us in the society at large, but in the media representation, we are absent. Exhibits like this showcases our nuanced picture of who the American is today. It's not just an Asian American film festival. You have more non-Asians hanging out in this Asian American film festival, and they are getting into other things in the life of the city. Having these hybrid events with PATH is so exciting because then you get to have that community that gets built. And seeing Asian American bodies on stage and seeing them really take a bigger presence, it's all that visibility. I wouldn't be able to do this if it weren't for the people who came before me. All right. Um, well, I hope you enjoyed the clip, and I, I think that that will give us a little bit more context um, as we begin talking specifically about PATH a little bit later in the call. But uh, first, I wanted to uh, hand it over to Dr. Kirsch to give a, a more uh, context, um, not just on yourself and the kind of work that you do at SOAS, but about some of the other uh, topics that I think will uh, kind of lead into a, a more rich discussion about the specifics of what we're kind of trying to do here in Philadelphia with this film festival. Thanks, Rob, and thank you, Dr. Kansara, for the kind introduction. Um, hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to um, do this webinar. So, um, my name is Griselda Skirsch. Um, I as uh, Dr. Kansara already said, I've worked on Sino-Japanese relations on, and their media representation on screen, how um, Chinese were represented throughout the rise of China in Japanese television and film mainly. I um, also looked for a while at um, um, commercials, but that <laughs> at some point I, I dropped. I'm teaching um, a first year module called Cool Japan. And this first year module, um, first year undergraduate module is compulsory for all B Japanese students coming to class. And it's more like a cultural sensitization module rather than uh, anything else, because we talk about how the concept of Japan actually um, was developed in the UK. Um, where does it come from? How do we consume it? And on the other side, how does Japan actually cash in on that? And we make lots of reference to media representations of Japan and otherness of the otherness of, of the Japanese in the British media. So um, Rob has asked me to give a very brief overview of otherness in media and how this relates to one another and I suppose um, I have to keep it really short because I could talk for hours and hours on end. Um, the media, um, it's often very debatable to what extent they actually do have an influence on us. 
So um, the more media literate you are, the more you question what you are being given, the less you will actually notice that they do have an influence on you um, because um, of their constant exposure. And we've had some of these themes already in um, Rob's excellent um, film that we just saw. It's the absence of representation when people can't see themselves represented on screen. But on the other side, if you are represented, how are you represented? What patterns of representation um, can actually be there? And for us as a group of people to create a sense of who we are, representation of ourselves in the media is um, incredibly important. So because the media can give us guidance in that sense, showing us what kind of behavior is acceptable and what kind of behavior is not acceptable. And very often unacceptable behavior is um, put onto another, whatever kind of shape and form that other might have, thereby telling us very often much more successif uh, successfully who we are not rather than necessarily who we are. So um, Another aspect to consider is who actually is in charge of those representations. And while most um, producers would, uh, particularly in the 21st century, would probably be quite um, conscientious about representation, some are not. And if you look back in the history of representation of otherness, um, there are quite a few representations that we today would consider outright racist. Um, but back in the day were, were not questioned and just put out there. So because otherness is so incredibly important in the media, um, there has actually been an awful lot of research on it. So um, one person who's worked mainly on German and Hollywood film and who um, Paul Rock was um, probably tortured with is a media researcher <laughs> called Werner Faustich. And he came up with three uh, patterns, exoticism, salvation and horror. And as you can see from these three patterns, they are very broad brush. Um, so all sorts of people can actually be either exotic as in incredibly different from whoever we are. Um, they can provide a source of salvation as in um, the sort of moving into our lives, changing it for the better, and then very often dying and disappearing, which is something I very much saw in the Japanese media when it comes in relation to otherness. So the other swoops in, turns everybody's lives around, and then the characters usually tragically die. And um, horror as the other, as a real threat to our existence, to our being. And you can see, that um, in addition, you could add that what he didn't put in is that the other can be funny, it can be grotesque. We can, it's never quite sure whether, whether we laugh with them or about them. So, um, and a second aspect, which has only kind of come recently into the um, discussion is to what extent we actually feel that this other, otherness is relevant for us. Um, if we see a horror representation, would this not, um, and that is very hard to quantify, would this not feel, um, affect our feelings and, and uh, towards this group of people? Would a constant re-representation of a group of people in relation to the horror pattern not actually cement the stereotypes and categories that we have of them? And you can see, again, these kinds of um, feelings being expressed in um, discourses, particularly around Islamophobia. Before I ramble too much, um, <laughs> I'm aware we have a bit of a time issue. I will leave it at that and I'm very happy to take any further questions um, in the chat later on um, between Rob and myself because we had indeed a very good pre-discussion. So yes, over to you again, Rob. Yeah, thank you for that uh, very concise but very informative uh, explanation of the otherness in particular Faustisch's work and um, you know as we had mentioned in the the conversation earlier I continue to teach Faustisch to my own students so they too are being tortured with his theories um, but you know for a little bit more context um, when I was at SOAS in 2009-2010 um, Dr. Kirsch was uh, one of the um, mo I think most influential uh, academics in my time there uh, mainly because um, I was the only graduate student in her module on Japanese popular media, meaning that we had weekly chats 
in her yes. office in, a, in, in lieu of a formal graduate uh, course on top of that. So we, we did have quite a bit of time um, to debate various media theories. And I think certainly a lot of that um, did help in the conceptualization of, um, you know, as I began a career working in, in film programming and specifically organizing film festivals, to sort of keep front and center these ideas of the impact that media has on the subconscious mind of the audience. And I think beyond that, um, you know, with my focus being in both Japanese cinema um, in the UK, I, I co-founded Zipangu Fest, which was the first Japanese film festival in the UK alongside Dr. Sharp and some other British Japanese film scholars. And a lot of the work that we did at that time, while I was also studying at SOAS, was trying to uproot these very orientalist images of Japan that existed in the British popular press and popular media um, by basically countering it with authentic portrayals of Japanese-ness from Japanese filmmakers. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work that I've continued to do in the decade that I've lived back in the United States has sort of followed along that same trajectory except instead of Japan and Japanese-ness, I'm focusing on Asian diasporic content and specifically the Asian American and Pacific Islander American communities. Um, so I guess before we get more into that component, I did also want to uproot the idea of the public sphere. Um, Jürgen Habermas and his theories around the public sphere, I think were also instrumental in my understanding at least of the role that film festivals can play in the shaping of public discourse. And um, uh, Dr. Kirsch, I'm not sure if you want to talk a little bit about Habermas and the public sphere. Um. <laughs> well, um, I suppose it's again, there's something to put into two minutes is probably incredibly difficult. But the idea is that um, the public sphere is almost like a discussion space, which is very much what you, it, it's sort of media shaped, but it's also very much based in, in sort of discursive, it's a discursive space where you can have conversations about things and where public opinion and, um, is, is formed and phrased. However, I think we're sort of going back to, because it's um, going back to what you do with the film festivals and what we discussed is that I think you use your film festivals very much in that idea of a public sphere, a public space. You, you have a conversation, you have exhibitions. It's not just people going to the cinema, watching a film, going back home. But it's more than just media consumption. You actually put the question of representation into the space of, of where the public of the public sphere and taking it out of these just simply one way consumption, but make it more of a discursive element in it so um and i think i'm glad to hear that i influenced you and i think you'd be glad to hear that our discussions have, have actually guided the creation of cool japan because i realized we needed to have more of a debate about what japan actually means and where this where this comes from and again again looking at this concept um, of habermas of the public sphere and where japan sits in that in, in the UK and how it can be discursively described. Yeah, and um, you know, I think it's just, it's, it's kind of fascinating to take a step back even from the idea of film festivals, but just thinking about the public sphere in this era, um, as people move away from physical discourse, right? Like when people yeah. would have the salon culture of uh, early modern Europe or you know, even the idea of a public square where someone can come and have these conversations in real time with their peers, um, usually bumping shoulders with individuals who come from a, a great diversity of thought and opinion, uh, whether or not that actually impacts the way that they think, um, it at least gives the opportunity to have an opposing viewpoint. Um, to the extent that you're sort of forced to listen to what someone has to say if they're standing in front of you, um, obviously, you know, a lot of people have written about um, the internet as being the, the main public sphere uh, of this era, and it certainly is. But I think what we've sort of witnessed in the last decade or so, particularly with the rise of social media, is this uh, siloing and, and sort of echo chamber effect, particularly related to political opinion, 
Um, whereas people formerly may have tolerated the, the opposing political viewpoints uh, when they're sort of forced to be in a, a co-mingled space with others, you have the ability to defriend or unfollow someone if they express an opposing viewpoint to the extent that some people find themselves in this total echo chamber where they don't have anyone to really balance out the perspectives that are um, essentially agreeing with their own minds. And I think this is one of the major issues that we see polarizing um, the citizenry, not just here in the United States, but I think also in the UK. And I, I, you know, certainly we've observed those kinds of conversations around Brexit. Um, and obviously we have a very contentious presidential election at the moment here. So um, I don't think it's an accident that these things have sort of uh, intersected and, and it continues to complicate it. And um, you know, even as we talk about what happens next, um, the fact that people at this particular moment in the COVID pandemic under social um, safe distancing guidelines are not able to gather in person presents an incredible challenge um, as far as you know, how do people actually continue to gather, how do they organize, and um, what does discourse look like if we know that people are essentially siloing themselves off um, in that social media environment. Um, so I, I think, yeah, the public sphere, at least from my understanding and conceptualization, has been the physical space. Yes, and I think that is why your physical film festival space is actually so incredibly important because you break those boundaries that, well, this rather fractured public sphere, not how Habermas meant it, like this public space where everybody got together um, and could just discuss things or um, I think I always feel that the public sphere is kind of not necessarily the best translation of the German original <laughs> word. So which is why I always struggle a little bit talking about this being German myself um, and getting the, the wording right because I wouldn't have read Habermas in English. I have read Habermas in German. So <laughs> there's, there's, there's this slight conceptual issue that sometimes my head doesn't switch this. So Habermas envis envisaged this like a big white sort of square, the German word for this being Öffentlichkeit, but that has two meanings. On the one hand, it's the outside world, and on the other hand, is actually everything, the entirety of human life and human interaction. So, and with the internet, this kind of human interaction is a bit more fragmented, in, and we sit in our silos, and you break those silos with the, with the film festival, and you get people, as one of your um, participants in the video, I can't remember who it was, said you have more non-Asian American people often there. And I think it's great that people then also actively go to perhaps break their own boundaries and their own conceptualizations. Yeah, and I, I think that that's actually been one of the more interesting challenges because as we sort of look at who the audience is, um, we have to understand that um, if we are being very upfront about some of the social issues, uh, particularly the racial and economic justice issues that are central to a lot of the Asian American film movement, um, that certainly alienates certain audiences, right? And finding mm -hmm. ways to, to make that content palatable, understanding that the individuals who may have a knee-jerk response to that um, and decide not to come are also likely the people who could benefit the most from uh, engaging in that content. Um, so, you know, in part, I think one of our strategies has really been to approach difficult conversations through art and using art and entertainment in ways to sort of almost trick someone into having a difficult conversation. <laughs> because I think that the, the barrier to entry when you are going to, for example, a concert or uh, when you are um, eating at a, a chef culinary demonstration, there may still be a lot of these cultural and social justice components to it. And, you know, a lot of the speakers and um, presenters are chosen for those purposes. But the audience member who is being attracted by the entertainment component isn't necessarily thinking about that front of mind when they're deciding whether or not to come to this event. Um, and yet they still have that opportunity to be exposed to those viewpoints. And I, I think more often than not come away from it with a, a more 
uh, progressive viewpoint. Um, you know, and I think this might be a good time to kind of think a little bit more about the Asian diaspora specifically. I know that we, we most likely have um, some folks joining us from overseas. So just to kind of clarify, um, here in the United States, uh, our census demographic terms uh, Asian America Pacific Islander as a single demographic which is, is really ludicrous because it's more than 40 unique cultures and countries of origin who have extremely different linguistic uh, backgrounds as well as many different circumstances for coming into this country at many different time periods. So unfortunately, American popular media has sort of painted Asian Americans with the same broad brush. Um, a lot of the stereotyping is that the Asian community is a monolith. And um, so much of what the Asian American movement does in general is to try and disaggregate that data through the individual lived experiences and kind of helping people to understand the, the holistic um, viewpoint of who these people are, what they're doing here in this country, um, what their lived experiences are here. Um, you know, and I think it is a particularly challenging time period uh, for the Asian American community as we sort of face the stereotyping um, of China flu or China virus, Kung flu. I mean, these are words that have been used by the President of the United States in his speeches and rhetoric uh, and do have a profound impact on the way that um, Asian Americans are being targeted. In fact, uh, more than 400% spike in anti-Asian hate crimes uh, has happened in the months since the COVID-19 pandemic began here in the United States. So I, I think there's certainly a, a direct linkage to that. I think I would add for that um, from the UK perspective. If you say the word Asian, you don't necessarily mean East Asian. Um, it tends to refer more to people from the Indian subcontinent. And if you mean East Asian, people tend to, again, broad brush wise, see China as a past pro toto. Um, they might have a, a concept of Japan as not China, but to what extent it might culturally differ. Apart from that, it produces manga and anime. If you are lucky, then you might. But um, other than that, there is very little um, differentiation and Korea doesn't necessarily um, feature much in India apart from the fact that they seem to produce some mobile phones. So um, there's this broad brush categorization of Asia as in the Asian subcontinent and everything beyond that kind of, of Asia, um, East Asia, which is a sort of a china -y thing. Um, not so Maybe last week, one very um, popular television program, The Great British Bake Off, to those of you who have lived in the UK, um, had a Japan week, the first Japan week ever. And we found recipes like um, Chinese steamed buns filled with uh, dal. So nothing Japanese whatsoever in many of the recipes. So you, well, you would have maybe uh, expected azuki beans and matcha. Uh, as flavors, nothing like that appeared, but they just had this um, very Chinese image of, of Japan, which uh, then led to a social media outcry of um, the Japanese community in the UK and said, if, if you do that, do at least please try to get it right with your participants so that we have Japan and not some mix and mesh um, idea of, of East Asia. Um, or respectively China, or even with a little bit of Indian flavor in the shape of a dal. So um, it's uh, that kind of categorization, which you could see in, in, our, um, in Faustich's work, does also relate to the same way that we tend to categorize groups of people. So East Asia, and is, is even in the UK, just East Asia, and there's ne not necessarily um, greater nuance in the representation. Absolutely. And, you know, that uh, example, I'm glad that you raised it because that's also been on my mind recently. But um, it reminded me of, I think it was the 2014 Video Music Awards. Katy Perry did a, a performance of a song called Unconditional, um, in which she mm. sings about this kind of unconditional love. Uh, dressed in sort of like a hodgepodge of uh, Japanese geisha, 
combined with like a Cheongsam, like Korean dress using Chinese parasols. Yes. And, you know, it's that really that hodgepodge of East Asian cultures that um, unfortunately, I think, contribute to that idea that one, Asia, or at least East Asia is a monolith. And two, these cultures are interchangeable, which um, obviously is not the case. Um, but, you know, I think in the context of, of like a diasporic content, right, um, one of the things that uh, I, I kind of came to understand um, after living in the UK and returning to the US, um, you know, I had a very limited perspective prior to living in London. I, I grew up in a, a suburban rural community in uh, Connecticut where um, I'm part of a mixed race Japanese American family. Um, and we were, I think the only, we were the only Japanese Americans in a town of 18,000 people. Um, I had no concept for what Asian cultures were or even Asian American cultures beyond this very limited perspective of uh, being Japanese. And I think that was only something that I uh, sort of understood through the, the Issei uh, immigrant generation great grandmother of mine who um, lived until I was in college, actually. Um, so, you know, kind of looking at how we come to understand our own cultures, our own communities in the context of diaspora, when contemporary popular media doesn't show authentic portrayals of ourselves, we either, I think, turn inwards and um, work within our own communities to create more authentic uh, portrayals. And I think that's certainly indicative of the Asian American movement. Uh, or I think the alternative is that some people will then consciously try to assimilate because the only representations that they see of themselves in the mainstream tend to be these very negative ones that Faustisch wrote about. And, um, you know, certainly we, we are at no shortage of those in American popular media. Um, but no, go, up, go ahead. <laughs> I was actually going to mention, um, you know, I, I know that one of the uh, topics that you've specialized in is uh, sort of like film and historical memory and the impact of that media has in general. And um, this might be a good time to sort of bring some of that into the conversation as well, because I think certainly both in the US and the UK context, uh, there have been many wars with Asia, right? And in the British context, certainly outright colonization in the American context, I mean, colonization of the Philippines, overthrow of the sovereign kingdom of Hawaii, military occupations in Japan and Korea, uh, obviously the Southeast Asian wars, um, you know, and, and so all of these things have an impact on the way that the general public understands who Asians are. And I think in particular in the United States context, Hollywood cinema tends to show this uh, scarcity of Asians as characters beyond sort of the faceless bad guys in a, a series of war films from the 1940s until the 1980s. Um, and just kind of wondering if you might comment a little bit about that idea of film and historic memory. Film and historic, uh, it's, it's very similar to film and otherness in, in a way you need the media to re-narrate re the narrative of having fought and one slash lost the war, renovate the trauma of that particular war and therefore keep the memory alive. But particularly with the Second World War and the First World War, all we are now left with is very few testimonials of people who have actually lived through it. So the lived memory gets gradually replaced by media-made memory. And um, media-made memory goes very much then again back to almost like erecting a um, memorial somewhere on a public um, square, which brings us back to Habermas again, <laughs> and the uh, public sphere of, of memory. So it's um, very publicly remembered, but very often only very publicly remembered in a very certain way, with a very clear ideological dominant narrative point of view. So in order to keep the memory alive. And um, in a way, this kind of leads you back to Faustisch, because in a war, if you narrate war memory in a film, you need an enemy, and that enemy is the other, and that enemy is very much um, in the horror pattern 
and then uh, because it's where the threat to the integrity of a nation comes from in the shape of um, very often almost grotesquely um, shaped enemy which you can very much see in many of the Hollywood um, war movies made on Japan and only um, where there was maybe a bit more Japanese input on it does maybe the it becomes a little bit more balanced um, and less grotesque like in for instance Tora 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 where this grotesqueness is lacking um, but it's a co-production and only then can you kind of see well this is our side this is your side but most of the films that deal with war aren't necessarily co-productions and they will very much just focus on the story that the main narrative that has been taught at school that is being upheld not necessarily leaving space for contesting narratives which um, can sometimes be very difficult to um, then convey that it is not necessarily just like the media saw it or showed it and you saw it in the media. Yeah, thanks for that. And I, I think it actually segues nicely into um, one of the last points that I wanted to sort of address with regards to some of the specific work that we've been doing through PATH. Um, in the last minute or so of the recap trailer that we showed early on, um, I was discussing the American Peril exhibit of the history of anti-Asian racism in the United States. Um, that project came about sort of as a result to the 2016 presidential election and the amounts of anti-Asian and xenophobic um, rhetoric that was coming from first candidate Trump and later President Trump um, really did have profoundly negative impacts on various communities, but particularly the Asian American community. And uh, one of the more visible targets were the Muslim American community. Mm -hmm. Um, with the Muslim travel ban and, um, you know, the many uh, Islamophobic hate crimes that took place here in the United States. Um, it seems necessary to sort of delve into the history of um, basically the very same content that we are talking about here through cinema uh, in terms of how are the historical memory being preserved of these conflicts between different groups, particularly when the, they are othered either by religion or race or both. And that was certainly the case in many of these contests, um, you know, contests between Asia and the United States and also the UK. But, um, you know, in this collection, as a, as a professor at, um, in the Asian American Studies program at Penn, I frequently um, collect anti-Asian, uh, what I call propaganda, basically printed materials, that demonstrate some type of anti-Asian sentiment, either used for commercial purposes or outright political purposes. Um, and over the last maybe three or four years, I've managed to amass a collection of about 150, uh, maybe 200 objects. Um, and so in 2018, we actually put together an exhibit that was uh, shown in that video, which actually uh, was mounted again in early 2020. We had a, a second, phase of that exhibit that was at City Hall here at Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, it seems, I think, to some people who have been following the work of the film festival for a while, a bit antithetical to what we typically do, because, you know, the whole idea of Asian American cinema is that you show these positive portrayals to sort of counter the negative stereotypes. Um, in fact, we were doing the opposite by actually surfacing these very anti-Asian stereotypes but for the purpose of studying them and calling them out and um, really understanding what was happening in the moment that we were living through in 2018. And unfortunately, subsequent waves of xenophobia here in the United States have kept that very relevant um, even today as we're kind of dealing with the backlash of the disease scapegoating for COVID-19. In um, when COVID broke out in the UK, it had a very similar trajectory because everybody who had an East Asian face, um, there were hate crimes against East Asians. So not just Chinese people, also Japanese and Koreans reported um, an increase in hate crime because and even also the rhetoric was nowhere near as inflammatory. Um, still this this conceptualization and of the other as the disease bringer and therefore again going us back to um, horror was very much um, present in in the discourse and in in particular silos um, on the social on social media. Mm 
So, um, yeah, it was kind of remarkable too, because the more that I've studied it, um, the more I realized that in the yellow peril anti-Chinese sentiments that were present in the UK and Europe as well as the US, but I think more more prevalent in the US at the turn of the 19th century, uh, disease scapegoating was part of that as well. And yes. you know, oftentimes they're talking about the outbreaks of cholera, typhoid, smallpox, even the bubonic plague, and tracing these to Chinatowns to the extent that uh, many of them were raised from the ground. And I think all of Honolulu's Chinatown was uh, burnt to the ground at one point, as well as much of San Francisco's uh, for the, the same fear that these people were bringing in the disease with them, um, when in fact epidemiologists, uh, after the fact, have, have proven that it was coming from all of these other known sources. Yes, but in order to um, talk about these stereotypes, you need to look at the mainstream media. I mean, it's, it's, of course, what you're doing is really important and very good, but at the same time, you also, and you told me that you were doing this a little bit more now, sort of looking at the mainstream media and their representation of, of Asian Americans, um, because, and then get people to discuss about what is actually problematic about this representation is um is a really good approach so as i said i do that with my students the first year undergraduate students i get them to talk about what is problematic or about representations of japan in british media in order to question the stereotype or get them to question their stereotypes yeah there's um certainly a lot more to unpack there yes. although um looking at the time I, th I think it might be good for us to open it up to some questions from the audience if if we have any yes so there is already one which i have put in the chat um the name of the author of patterns of representation because it's a german name so it's quite complicated <laughs> i thought it was better to spell it out any questions um So um, I don't think everybody can see this. Uh, things may have improved since those horror representations in the war movies you described from the 40s and 50s, etc. But do modern cinematic representations still reinforce stereotypes and how from Lucy? Yeah, I mean, um, thanks, Lucy, for the question. And I think it, it kind of helps to kind of break down maybe what we're talking about here as well, because I think that, um, you know, film and cinema are, are one part of the conversation, but television media is another big part, particularly here in the United States, because um, you know, with the, the actual extremely uh, high budgets for the Hollywood studio, um, your average Hollywood film, small budgeted is $20 million, right? Uh, we're looking at 100 to $200 million budgets on many of the major studio films. Um, casting directors aren't willing to risk casting an Asian person in a leading role or even oftentimes in a supporting role because they're gambling with this extreme volume of money which doesn't necessarily exist in other national cinemas to the same extent. Um, and unfortunately, the I think inherent racism that it does exist here in the United States and, and in other uh, overseas box offices has suggested over time that that may be a factor that would limit the marketability of certain films. And we've certainly seen those trends uh, being reversed somewhat, I think in the last five years since uh, Black Panther was released uh, to much box office success. Crazy Rich Asians was another example. Um, so that's one side of the coin. But again, going back to television, um, so many of the representations that we've had of Asian Americans um, still sort of focus on a couple of key things. One is the perpetual foreigner, which is that um, Asian people are all immigrants and they don't have a good command of the English language. They speak in heavily accented uh, tropes. Um, and, you know, that sort of limits the ways in which people can be seen as true Americans, right? Um, and I think the, the distance between this like whole wholesome white American identity, um, which has been sort of the default setting for the American for a long time, um, that is still something that a lot of Asian Americans contend with. 
One of the other things is the uh, hypersexualization and fetishization of Asian women. Uh, we often see that uh, trope being associated with uh, women who are uh, sexually available, submissive, um, and you know that is playing up a lot of tropes related to the history of the power and this kind of uh, imbalance between the West and the East um, in the colonial time period and even more contemporarily with the many wars that were waged there by the United States. Um, another aspect is the emasculation of the Asian male, uh, sort of Asian men as sexually undesirable, um, not fitting the stereotypes of a, a cisgendered um, heterosexual male um, and therefore not being sexually desirable to uh, white women or women who are not Asian themselves. Um, so not quite the horror aspect that you're talking about. Um, there are certainly examples of that, but I would say that the three that I just named now are kind of more prevalent in American uh, media discourse today. I think you can still add the war films because um, what was the title of the film? Angelina Jolie, Unbreakable, with the incredibly brutal Japanese prison guard. So war films are being made today as well. And you will, um, and Faustisch didn't write about the 40s and 50s. He wrote about the 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s. So he had a va vast database. He didn't have, um, he didn't just look at this. So horror and stereotypes are still there. They might not always be horror as in the actual enemy and even that hasn't disappeared. So there are still um, war films on the war in the Pacific and Vietnam where the enemy is clearly Asian connoted. Um, there is um, a question from um, Pamela. Interesting discussion, but I do wish um, the pendulum did not swing so violently on stereotype, or colonialists and Japanese and Chinese bad. Where's the middle ground? Does the middle ground exist anymore? Well, it's an interesting viewpoint, I think, because, um, you know, certainly there are a lot of um, different viewpoints on the colonial time periods, right? But um, I think if you were to ask the average person who was colonized versus the average person who comes from a country that were the colonizer, uh, obviously the, the viewpoint would be positive or negative based on that. Um, it's, it's not something, I think it's easy to be revisionist at times in history, but it's also important to understand the many structural racisms and inequities that led to those systems being, um, you know, created in the first place. And I think here in the United States, at least, that does involve racism. And we have these kind of foundational racisms in the United States, uh, such as the indigenous genocide and African slavery that have sort of characterized the way in which our society has organized itself in a racial hierarchy, um, you know, as Asian immigrants and later American-born Asian Americans sort of come into the picture. Um, that changes the dynamic, it changes the discussion, but these are still people who are sort of uh, working within the construct of, um, you know, the, the racial hierarchy that has been established um, that still sort of has a, a white supremacist undertone and an anti-Black undertone, at least in the United States. Well, maybe not quite as pronounced. So uh, statistics in the UK have that the darker the skin color, the more likely you are to be stopped and searched. So institutionalized racism is also present in the UK. So um, I think this sort of racial hierarchies exist. Um, there were long debates about whether colonialists deserve statues or whether they should be torn down. So um, this, yes, it's, it, um, it's easy to, to say um, it's, it doesn't, it swings from one stereotype and the middle ground, I suppose, we're talking about media and the media uh, live off tensions. But at the same time, so tensions make the plot more interesting. Racial conflicts make the plot more interesting. Um, and therefore the middle ground gets kind of wiped out in the narrative, but that then shapes people's perceptions and therefore the middle ground kind of moves out of the perceptions for people. 
The next question we have is, uh, do you see the growing markets of other countries' film industries, um, China's in particular, having an impact on Western film markets and thus people's overall understandings? That's from Aaron. So in the American context, absolutely, because uh, if you look dollars and cents for the number of people that are potential box office customers in China, it is so much higher than the total box office here in the United States that most Hollywood studios have basically just taken as a, a given at this point that they need to sort of cater to some of the tastes and interests of the Chinese mainland. Um, now, what does that actually mean in terms of the uh, storytelling and casting decisions? We've certainly seen more mainland Chinese actors and actresses being offered roles in major Hollywood films. Um, I would argue that does absolutely nothing to help the Asian American or Asian diasporic communities, because in all honesty, it just sort of reinforces the idea of like Asians as, as foreign others versus the fact that, you know, like my family who came here four generations ago from Japan, um, there are many multi-generational Asian Americans uh, in this country. Um, so, you know, I think that's one part of it, but I think the other part is that there are also tensions and uh, different types of political conservatism that exist obviously uh, in China that um, some Hollywood studios have begun to cater to in terms of uh, what themes are being explored, um, whether some of the uh, plot points could actually be viewed as analogies for some of the other issues that are happening in China um, related to the Uyghur Muslims or other communities. Um, I know another sort of flashpoint is um, the sort of anti-blackness that is being perceived. Um, I know one very high profile example in the Star Wars, uh, the newest trilogy, the character Finn, who's played by uh, John Boyega, uh, African um, American or African British man, um, he was taken out of the, the poster. He's one of the main characters um, and yet uh, his character was reduced to you know the the very far background of the poster compared to the American poster where he is standing shoulder to shoulder with Ray, the the lead female character. Um, so limited examples, but certainly things that I think we'll start to see more of and and more pronounced also um, as China's um, political and economic power becomes more uh, evident on the global stage. Yeah, if I could add two things to that. Um... Having not grown up in the UK, but in Germany, I was always at the receiving end of Hollywood. And um, we got dubbed versions of Hollywood films. So there's a translation process. Um, in some series when the subject would have been too disturbing, as in too much about the war, we didn't get them. There's one Star Trek episode in the original series um, where they travel to some kind of um, Nazi world. That episode was never broadcast in Germany because it was perceived as being too upsetting. So as a film travels or as a series travels, it makes a journey very much so. Things are being cut out um, in a translation, changed, deliberately changed, um, so that it doesn't um, it doesn't upset audiences as much. So the product that leaves Hollywood will not necessarily always be the product that reaches its target country. And um, conversely, I think the Chinese are in, in, uh, injecting more money into the Hollywood film industry. So um, a lot more Hollywood films are being made with at least Chinese sponsorship. Um, if you look very closely at when you go to the cinema where the money came from and very often Chinese film companies will be listed. So you can see closer cooperation, but whether that will lead to better representation or to a simple silencing of problems because they may not be politically palpable around the world is, a completely, is, up, is up for debate. Yeah. Um, well, I know we are short on time and I, I just wanted to be respectful of everyone's time here. But, um, you know, thank you so much, Dr. Kirsch, for joining me in this conversation today. Um, thank you, Rob. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Yeah, I've, I've certainly thank enjoyed you, reconnecting and, and hopefully um, we can continue having these types of transnational discourses.
Um, one thing that I wanted to mention before I uh, introduce Greg from American Friends of SOAS um, was to uh, check out the programs that are, are happening uh, right now. The Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival began last night. And um, for the next 11 days, we're going to be uh, having an all virtual film festival. Um, if you're in the US or Canada, you can actually rent any of the feature films uh, at any point throughout the 11 days. Um, all of the short films are available internationally. And uh, a great deal of the panel discussions and live music and theater programs are all going to be live streamed completely free of charge on the, the PATH YouTube channel as well as Facebook Live. Um, so much of the discourse that we're talking about that takes place in the film festival takes place in the context of the Q&As with filmmakers and also the panel discussions, um, all of which is available free to the public. Um, so I hope that you will join us no matter where you're tuning in from um, at some point over the next 11 days. And um, Greg? I'll just jump back on. Yeah. Um... I'll be very quick here. Yeah, thank you both so much um, for that really insightful and interesting discussion. Um, just wanted to say on behalf of our entire AFSOAS Board of Directors and the entire SOAS alumni community here in the US, um, everybody who joined us today and everybody who will be able to watch this um, video on our YouTube channel later, um, I want to, um, of course, extend our Sincerest thanks to you both, um, to Dr. Kirsch, um, head of department of East Asian Languages and Cultures at SOAS, um, and to Rob, who is the board chair um, of the Philadelphia Asian American Film Festival, um, which is happening now through November 15th. Um, and as Rob mentioned, there's a variety of uh, ticket options available and we'd really encourage you to check that out. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank our AFSOAS vice president, um, Dr. Barthi Kinsara um, for organizing another engaging virtual event for us. Um, as the Association of SOAS Alumni here in the US, AFSOAS shares and promotes SOAS's educational aims of advancing the study of Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, and we support projects and activities which meet those aims. Um, so since 2012, um, in addition to building our, our support network for alumni here in this country, We've helped to channel over a million dollars in support for various departments um, at SOAS, scholarship programs, academic studies, um, and even some global relief efforts. Our flagship program, though, is the John Loyello AFSOAS Official Scholarship. Um, the purpose of this scholarship is to give an American student the life-changing opportunity to study a full-time uh, one-year taught master's program at SOAS. Um, and to date, we've had seven recipients um, so if you're able, we would really appreciate your support of this initiative in particular. Um, you can make a tax deductible contribution. I included the link um, in the chat box. Um, so if you enjoyed today's talk, um, we'd be really grateful um, for your contribution in any amount. Um, or alternatively, you can earmark a gift to the Department of East Asian Languages and Cultures um, or any other designation of your choosing at SOAS. Um, and the last thing, I just want to thank all of you for being with us, um, for your interest in the subject, and just for making the time to be with us. So thank you so much, and have a great day, everybody.